sometimes known as the Turtle Woman because we're all known by our market name. Um, I'm going to be showing you some of my jewelry today and I would like to start with my turquoise. Um, I, uh, since the beginning of the year with this uh, pandemic, I don't know about the rest of you, but it, it sort of took the creativity away. Creativity is something that we can do when we aren't in survival mode. And so what I ended up doing, because I didn't feel like going near my bench, is I ordered turquoise. I went online and I found some good stone cutters, which is always valuable when you're in this business. And um, so I'm going to be showing you um, a lot of Nevada turquoise. Uh, so first up is this lovely ring from mine number eight, they call it, in Nevada. This is a gorgeous piece of turquoise. This ring is about a ten and a half and just stunning. I don't know if you guys can pick that up. So that's one piece. Um, another piece. Actually, I do have a couple of pieces from Arizona Turquoise. This is a piece of Kingman Turquoise. They're called Waterfall Kingman. It's, it's rather rare and it's quite spectacular. And this ring is a seven and a half. And again, beautiful turquoise. I like this piece a lot. And all of the silver work is me. I build the settings. It's all custom work, which I'm usually pretty proud of. So tell us what a ring like that goes for. Um, right now my rings uh, in the turquoise, this one's 260. The first, my number eight is 220. And the next piece I will show you shortly is a little less. So rings are 210 to 275 generally for the nice big turquoise pieces. Uh, this one really unusual turquoise from a place called the Peacock Mine in Nevada. Real unusual material and quite stunning. This piece is 210 and is a size seven and three quarters. Really cool stuff. If you can catch that in your recordings. And another material I came across um, Verisite is a material similar to turquoise and often occurs in the same mine areas. And this piece is called Colina Verde. And it's a very unusual verisite. In fact, I think it looks like turtle shell, which I thought was appropriate since I'm in turtle work. Um, this piece is a size six and is 165 for this lovely Colina Verde. Love it. One of the things I found during all of this time off was a really cool Native American guy. I found him on Instagram. And like I say, finding a good stone cutter is worth everything. And I found this guy. Uh, he said I could promote him. He goes by Indigenized775 on Instagram. And he's a big Native American guy and he cuts big stones. Um, this piece lovely piece of Pilot Mountain turquoise is a Jason Hill indigenized piece. Again, Nevada turquoise. He lives in Nevada. Um, he's my connection. Um, so that was, I, I, I really like big pieces of turquoise. Uh, what else can I show you? I have a couple of cuffs of this one's an Arizona turquoise, and I cannot remember which mine this came out of, um, but it's it's quite lovely. This one is number eight, again, mine number eight. And I wanted to show people so I don't drill at you at markets because I've been known to do that. When people pick up a bracelet and they want to try it on and they bend it, I scream. Because what that does is it's going to destroy the bracelet. And so I try to take time to show people there's a little spot on our wrist that we can poke the piece into and then roll it on. I don't have to stretch it open. I can go for this little spot on my wrist and put it on and then reverse it when I take it off. 
So there's no need to stretch a piece open. And I try to give lessons on this, so now you know how to put the bracelet on and off without bending it. I learned the hard way. Uh, I learned silversmithing from my sister and a Navajo Indian in Arizona. And I had a lovely bracelet that I broke by doing that very thing. You put it on and off so many times that each time you bend it, you're creating a weak spot and it will eventually crack and break there. So now you've had a quick little lesson on how to roll it on and roll it off without bending it. And these guys, uh, the number eight is 175 and this Arizona turquoise is 200. Oh, they're just gorgeous. Oh my heavens. I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for turquoise. I am too. Love I it. love turquoise. You can tell by my bedroom. <laughs> wanted to show these little turquoise earrings. Um, the funny thing about the turquoise earrings is that, and I often make mismatched things because I just do. Somebody said, well, you know, those are two different colors. Yeah, they are a little bit different colors and they came from exactly the same mine. They are Kingman. And when you say Kingman mine, it, there's a lot of different stuff that, that, stuff that comes out of Kingman. But here's an example of Kingman turquoise out of the same mine, and it's two different colors. And stunning. I have a variety of really cool nugget pieces. Again, my, my fascination with Nevada. This nugget necklace is 17 inches, plus I put a I put an extender on my necklaces so that you can wear it anywhere from 17 to 20 inches. And um, this is Sierra Nevada turquoise. There's often a lot of green mixed in with the turquoise color. Really neat stuff. So Sierra Nevada. Here's, this one's almost, almost like a forest green. Again, it's a 17 inch with uh, an extender. And I put a really pretty rose cut tourmaline on the back of that. And this is called uh, the Nevada Fox Mine. Not hard to remember. And, and the turquoise coming out of the Fox Mine is often this deep forest green color, which is pretty spectacular. Um, and this piece, Actually, I got carried away and combined a couple of different Nevada turquoises to make a really long necklace because I also made this really cool crucifix that just asked for something much longer. So the cross actually is Kingman and 18 gauge silver. It's nice and thick. And this guy is 30 inches and Again, a combination of the Nevada turquoises. Uh, did I write it down? Some of it is South Hill and some of it's Emerald Valley. So I mixed two different ones together. So at 30 inches, could that also be worn as a choker? You can double it. Okay, mm -hmm. lovely. And I love that this first one that you showed us is graduated with the smaller stones on the back mm -hmm. and the larger at the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's just lovely and I love the tourmaline. I think that's it for my turquoise today that I wanted to show you. I have more. This is just a sample of what I have. Um, if you want to see more and I get organized, I will be taking more pictures and putting them on my Facebook page. I have um, Facebook.com Turtleworks Jewelry. That's where you find my the rest of my material. Um, I want to move on to my second favorite thing, which is the woolly mammoth molar that I'm working with. Um, strange concept. Uh, for instance, um, I'll try one of these on. Woolly mammoth molar. This is an honest to God woolly mammoth tooth. <laughs> and what happens is the surface is sliced and we get this really amazing material. So you can kind of see the lines uh, of the chewing surface of the tooth when we slice it. It's this really cool material. 
This is naturally colored. Some of the pieces I'm going to show you um, have some color added to them, and I don't generally use material that's been altered. I totally make an exception for this stuff because it's beautiful. The other thing, I, the reason I'm putting this on is these are pretty good sized earrings, and frequently I'm asked, well, aren't they heavy? No, they're not heavy. Um, so there's an example of natural woolly mammoth molar in an earring. Gosh, that's just lovely. I oh love my gosh, these. the tooth is so fascinating, isn't it? It's huge. This is a small one. This is from a sub-adult. Wow. Uh, normally, the tooth would be about twice this size. Neat material. It's a real hit at market, especially with young boys. They got to come and see the tooth. How many um, teeth does a woolly mammoth have? I have no idea. I don't know. I do know that this was bottom row, third molar in on the right side. Other than that, I don't know how many they have. Um, these are also the molar, and when I mention the color, these have a little bit of blue color added to them. Um, the material I'm using is kind of recycled, meaning the woman who we get this material from in Alaska, um, she does add some color when she stabilizes it uh, because she cuts it up and inlays it in the handles of men's pocket knives. So the fancy pocket knives you see in a jewelry store. She does the inlay with this and um, we get her scraps. Uh, so it is altered uh, when it's stabilized. Um, these are natural. These are also natural molar. And what's significant about these guys is it looks like color was added, but these are natural. Occasionally, whatever the poor woolly mammoth died next to can become incorporated into them. And so um, you'll find some greens, browns, um, and blues naturally occurring. So these are natural, whereas the other ones had color added to them. So now, oh, I also have a ring. I have a ring of woolly mammoth tooth, which is really neat stuff. Normally it's not good material for rings. Uh, kind of interesting that even though it's a big fossil, it's a little delicate. The lines is actually a mineral replacement that's sort of a crystal and it can fall apart. So I tell people, eh, it's not always easy to find the right part to make a ring out of. And sometimes when people have bought a ring, they come back and it's all crushed and they hold it up. And, okay, I can fix that. I can with the right chemical. So that's uh, the tooth. But I also, under woolly mammoth, have a tusk. We started getting pieces of tusk. And uh, so the first that I worked with, it's actually a cross section of the end of a tusk. And this is natural. And boy, the pattern in these things. I love this material. So some woolly mammoth tusk. Um, these are also the tusk. And I have two more here where I cut the back out of the earrings because in the right light, it, they glow. Uh, so the two additional pair, teardrop and these round guys, uh, again, tusk, but if I had some way of showing you how they glow, I would. Um, and probably my favorite piece of all of this is this ivory ring. So again, this was the tusk. I begged my stonecutter guy for this piece because I think it's stunning. So this is a piece of the tusk. Uh, where the other pieces were cross-section, this goes the long way, so you can see the grain of the, of the piece. And I should tell you that um, 
I often get asked, well, isn't that very rare material? And I will tell you, it used to be. Um, before our non-existent global warming, that's sarcasm. Uh, you know, the uh, ice flows, the permafrost, it's melting. And as it melts and sloughs away, it's revealing more fossils. Um, I don't know if you heard about a project that the South Koreans were doing in northern Russia, where they were going to try to extract DNA from a woolly mammoth and mix it with elephant DNA and try to recreate a woolly mammoth. Um, I saw Jurassic Park. It didn't end well. I really don't think we should mess with stuff like that. And the good news is it repeatedly fails, but they haven't given up. They, they're still trying to extract DNA. Um, I think we should just leave them right where they are. Uh, let's see. One of the materials I worked with a lot um, and now have a very small amount is the queen conch shell. I usually have a number of rings earrings, pendants. My, my sad story is I was getting my conch shell from Belize and since the pandemic I've not been able to travel there. They don't want us and I'm not going. So therefore I run very very low on the material. So I brought some ex examples of what, I, of what I do have. Um, I have a lovely cuff. I think is a, a lovely piece. And I like the variety of the color in the shell. Um, it's a simple little pendant that I put an Oregon opal on. And I usually say the sailboat went that way without me. This one has a lot of the texture in it that occurs up here in the curve of the shell. And again, the material is very lightweight. And I have a couple of rings. This one's probably one of my favorites, this big heart ring. And my heart ring, this one's 110, which is a little more than what I normally ask, but that's a little harder to cut and build. Queen conch heart. And here's another Have this round one. I'm not sure what size this is. Feels like it's about a seven. And this guy. And these give you a good example of the variety of the color. This one has a lot of gold in with the pink. I used to, I, my best friend and I swore off the color pink in junior high, like girls sometimes do. We were never going to wear pink. Uh, and here I am making pink jewelry, but I think because it's organic, you know, this is Mother Nature's pink. I get along with it just fine. I like the variety of, of Gosh, pinks. it's got a lot of peach in it. It's just lovely. So you see, you know, there's golds, hot pink, a lot of colors in one shell, and I try to take advantage of that. So can I ask, how do you, how do you cut open a shell like that to get these pieces? Um, the first step, is, and I use a tile saw for this, is I do what I call cut the guts out of it. It sounds terrible. But I want this section. And uh, with a tile saw, I cut that out. And I make a couple more cuts so that it's smaller pieces. And from there, I'm using a cutting disc on my Dremel because it just cuts right through it. There's two things to remember when cutting this shell. One is um, go slow. It doesn't like the heat from friction, from trying to cut it too fast. And uh, you also have to wear a mask and cut it in water because it's very toxic, the, the dust from the conch shell. So the cutting it in water solves the heat from the friction as well as the, the dust problem. Otherwise, it's very easy to cut. Buzz right through it. Sounds easy to you, sounds <laughs> difficult to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I only brought one lonely little pair of conch earrings. Um, those are just lovely. I think they look so sweet. And these run, these are 120. Normally my earrings are anywhere from 75 
on up, depending upon how carried away and what else I added. Hold those them. up against your sweater, would you please? Yeah, those are just lovely. I like these guys. So, awfully short on comp shell this summer at markets, people would walk up and go, well, you certainly don't have as much as you usually do. So then I would say, well, if I could just go back to Belize, one of these days I will. Um, so that's it for my conch shell, my woolly mammoth tooth and tusk. And by the way, we had our own mammoth here in the Pacific Northwest. And a lot of people didn't know that. You know, there's the woolies, which are the huge guys, this guy. And here in the Pacific Northwest, we had what was known as the Columbia mammoth much smaller and the Columbia mammoth was still wandering around here about 10,000 years ago which wasn't very long in the bigger scope of things um, and it's not uncommon for people when beach combing to find tooth bone tusk uh, some lady a couple of summers ago in squim beach combing found a tooth she didn't know what it was and they are rather odd looking so she buried it and marked it and went home and got her husband <laughs> and then came back and said, what is it? He said, I don't know. So they took it to the Burke Museum at the University of Washington. He goes, mammoth tooth, see them all the time. If I were beachcombing and found some part of a fossilized animal, I would probably wet my pants. So I think that's pretty spectacular. And there was another, uh, some people found remains on Whidbey Island um, this last summer. So there's some students digging out there trying to see what they can find. And, and uh, Western, Western Washington University also has a dig going somewhere, but that's not information they let out very much. So we had our own mammoth, the Columbia mammoth. Now I think I'll show you some of the jade I work with. So here's another thing I hear all the time. I didn't know we had jade in Washington. Um, to which I always say, well, actually, we probably have one of the largest deposits on the planet. And I lucked out several years ago, eight years ago, uh, meeting the father and son who are mining this material up around the Darrington Oso part of the state. And yes, that terrible mudslide that happened in Oso did reveal a lot more material. Um, so it's a father and son that live in Edmonds. They found me and said, how would you like to vet some of this material? And sure. So now uh, I get creative say, you know, if I want a bunch of rectangles cut, they cut me a bunch of rectangles. I'm a very spoiled girl. Um, so I'm gonna show you some of the pieces. These I thought were quite lovely. These are kind of a light green. And I think you can see that they're translucent. Those the, are just lovely. The colors that they're finding, huge range. There's even some lavender. And right now, uh, the son, who's quite an accomplished carver, uh, they have found some material, how do I describe it? It's chatoyant, which means it has a iridescent glow to it. Um, and he's cutting material that's clear. Uh, you can see through it, and it's a bit blue on one side, green on the other side, with the with the chatoyants right down the middle, cat's eye. It's hard to describe. You would have to see it. Beautiful material. So yes, we have jade in the state of Washington. These pieces, which look like petrified wood, they are not petrified wood. They are little pieces of jade, and. These are cut from an outer layer of a rather large um, stone. And the outer layer is called mutton fat. Great term for material. These are pieces of mutton fat. And some markets prize this over the rest of the, the jade. Um, I think this stuff, it's so um, organic. It's so, like I said, it looks like petrified wood. Um, and these are the only two pieces I have left out of about 20. Uh, one of our little helpers at Everett Farmer's Market decided she had to have two pairs and she wears them together and they look fantastic. 
Um, the jade, I also have this really cool giant men's ring. This guy, I think it's 11 and a half. A little hard to see the color in that. This is a really solid oval tab of what they call their blue dream. And, and it would be almost impossible for you to see the blue in it, but it has a slight tint of blue along with the green and the black. That's just stunning, and I love the I love the setting. I love that it's setting. Really masculine. I need that. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah. So, are you going to tell us a little bit about how you got into jewelry making and how long you've been doing this, Dan? I had had my sister passed two years ago. My older sister was a silversmith, and uh, probably 35, 40 years ago. Um, she said, come down to Arizona where she was living and let's take some lessons from this redheaded Navajo named Kelly. He was really a, a, an amazing guy. He's gone also, but we sat in the desert and learned how to do <coughs> metal smithing. My sister was taking it to a new level. I was learning the basics. Um, the cool thing about learning from a Navajo is I would say, well, I wasn't formally trained. I can't teach people. And go, wait a minute, I was taught by the best. You sit in the desert. They don't pick up a catalog and order tools, you make tools to make the jewelry. So I had some of the best teachers around, very happy with that. Um, the other thing I wanted to show real quick, probably my top seller, and I have so many of these, I call them everyday earrings because they're just simple silver stamped designs and they're only 20 bucks a piece. They're the kind of earring you throw on and forget about it. And these, oh my God, I could make 30 pairs of these a day and still be behind. Um, and they're just simple um, and fun to make. And 100% sterling silver. 100%. Uh, so there's my, my spiel, examples of my material. Um, you can go to my Facebook page where I often take pictures of my bench that'll show things everywhere from finish to just pieces and what it's eventually going to be. Um, and I also take pictures of the finished material. I'm getting better at doing that since we're not doing so much in-person selling. I have to rely on that platform. So um, if you wanna see more examples, go to my Facebook page. And uh, I can take text messages on my cell phone when people leave me text messages on my landline i don't get them <laughs> and people keep doing that you didn't return my text message well, what number did you use oh my landline yeah that doesn't work you have to use my cell phone for for texting um so quick question if we're going to order online from turtle works jewelry um on facebook what uh, what's our time frame here now before christmas to make sure we're getting our gifts sent just like everybody else i i do free shipping so that's one of the things you need to know and my understanding is we're rapidly approaching the last opportunity to ship and still get it by christmas i'm not real sure you know somebody said the 11th i think that's what i'm hearing is the 11th uh of december yeah um i'll ship as soon as i can and then we're at the mercy of the U.S. Postal Service, which some days I get things the next day. I had a package that traveled from Seattle to Edmonds to Everett, back to Edmonds, back to Seattle. Then it went to Snohomish. I mean, I'm looking at tracking, and that package, it just had a hell of a good time. It went all over the place. Um, so I, all I can say is I will do my best to get things out quickly, and hopefully they arrive before Christmas. Great. Well, Jan, we have so enjoyed having you at the market today. Thank you for bringing your lovely, lovely Turtle Works jewelry. And follow Jan on Facebook. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Jan. Really beautiful work.